It's great to be with you, and this venue is very familiar to me. I um, do a bit of running. Uh, runners and vegans are the people that tell you about what they do the minute they meet you. <laughs> Vegan runners are a nightmare. Um, but this place will be 700 people in here next week and a lot colder, probably in less clothing. And if they do have to run, they'll get out here a lot faster than you will, I tell you. Because it's the Perth Half Marathon next week from this, this place. If you have a Bible with you, um, that would be great if you opened it to the book of Haggai. If you have an actual Bible, you may struggle to find it. Uh, if you have a phone, the only trouble you'll have with the Bible today is putting it into practice, I suppose, because you'll know you'll be able to type in Haggai and find it. So Haggai 1. So I'm going to uh, do a brief uh, flyover of Haggai chapter 1, uh, if you've got that with you. And there'll be some uh, quotes on some of the slides. So we've got the first one up. Sure. Here we go. But first is a way of introduction. Uh, you all know Baker's Delight. Um, I was going to Baker's Delight one Sunday about 15 years ago. Uh, it was memorable, because you go to Baker's Delight all the time, it was memorable for the point that I walked in and I bought my loaf of bread on a Sunday morning and uh, there was a sign in the window in Baker's Delight that day and it said, Baker's Delight is open Sunday. Whatever happened to the day of rest? I mean, Oh, well, that's all right. Yeah, what did happen to the day of rest? It sort of up and left without me really thinking about it, yeah. along with uh, the Lord's Prayer and school that I remember in the 70s and things like that. All the little Christian bits of uh, what we thought about culturally had sort of dissipated, and there was Baker's Delight open on a Sunday, and there was Mr. Northern Irish uh, Protestant, where everything, even the swings in the playground were chained down in Northern Ireland on Sundays, uh, in case you had too much fun. Um, there I was buying my loaf of bread on Sunday, and I was so impressed with that sign, I went back and said, can I have that? Can I have the sign in the window? And they gave it to me, and I've got it laminated, and I take it out every now and then. I've got it at home still. Baker's Delight is open Sunday. Whatever happened to the day of rest? Now, every action embeds a hypothesis about the future. Whether I'm choosing a school for my children, or taking the bins out on a Sunday night, or planning to start a war, Every action I do now embeds a hypothesis of what will happen in the future. And my hypothesis on the basis of that poster was, yeah, it's, it feels like the Christian thing is sort of folding its wings quietly, ducking down and hiding away. And that somehow the issue that we have with our culture is that uh, people are disinterested in Christianity and it will never make the pages of the paper in the future. And 15 years ago I was thinking, this is the direction we're going down. We're going to have to try and keep our heads up a bit more for people to even notice that Christians exist. And I did remember going to a conference at a big church where there were lots of leaders, and the person from England was standing on the stage and said, oh, you know, he was, he was the keynote speaker, and he said, I've just had heart problems. What would it say in your newspaper tomorrow if I dropped dead on this stage? And I used to be a journalist, so I wrote down the headline, person you've never heard of dies in a place you've never been to. And, <laughs> Because that's what it felt like. <laughs> Who knows the Christians these days? And my hypothesis, or my action, was say, let's keep our heads up. Yoo-hoo, we're over here, everybody. We're here. You know, No one's walking past our churches going, if I never go to church, that's the one I'm never going to. It's just like it wasn't on the radar. So 15, 20 years ago, I felt that our action was to try and reignite interest in the church among a generally disinterested, quite passive world towards Christianity. <coughs> How has my hypothesis worked in the <laughs> ensuing 15 years? And that's me as a pastor saying that. The trouble is, what happens when your hypothesis is wrong? What happens if the actions you take at the time are based upon a faulty hypothesis? And for a perfect and extreme example of this, we cross now to General John Sedgwick, Union Army General from the Civil War. Mm. Yeah. Their Confederate lines were 900 metres away and Confederate soldiers were taking pot shots at the Union Army. And he is walking, brusque as he is, along the line as his men duck and weave as bullets are flying in across, but from 900 metres away, it seems fairly safe. And he retorts to them, what, men dodging this way for single bullets? What will you do when they open fire across the whole line? Why are you dodging like this? They couldn't hit an elephant at that distance. Well, it turns out they didn't need to hit an elephant. They just needed to hit, hit him right under the left eye, which they promptly did, and he dropped down dead. 
Wow. They couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. You see, it turns out that General Sedgwick kept his head up in a keep-your-head-down world. Every action embeds a hypothesis about the future, and sometimes the future can be something that's fairly safe, and you go, oh, I got that wrong. But when you take a bullet under the eye, because you think they can't hit you from that distance, that could be a little bit more terminal. Well, back to my baker's delight. It feels like a keep your head down <coughs> world, doesn't it? It feels like it wasn't what we thought maybe 15 years ago. As a Christian, it feels more General Sedgwick than it does Baker's Delight, does it not? It feels like hostile interest, not bland disinterest. We start with, woohoo, we're over here, everyone, and oh, they're actually coming to, what, they've got, what's that, guns? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Pow! A wedding photographer taken out there. Boom! A Christian school principal misrepresented and hassled. Kapow! A political party proudly announcing it will cut all relig religious exemptions. rat -a tat tat Freedom of speech is a cover for religious bigotry. These are the things that we're hearing. Maybe, just maybe, the best action is to keep our heads down in this world. Though that's not the option you ever get in Scripture, is it? Yet it was the tactic being adopted by the people of God in the time of the prophet Haggai in the Old Testament. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord, or the Lord's house. The context is that we are in post-exile for God's people, Israel, and a small group return and they're rebuilding uh, the house of the Lord. And it's a vastly different hostile landscape. It ends up being a keep-your-head-down world for the people of God who are meant to declare the praises of him who brought them out of darkness into his marvellous light. And if you read the first verse of Haggai, what does it say? In the second year of Darius, the king... <laughs> the king is a pagan king over Israel now. Whereas there's no reference to a Jewish Israelite king. Things have changed. Darius, the king, is ruling... And then rebuilding of the temple, which was supposed to be the point where God's people would focus and get their identity, had stopped. There was pressure from the nations that had been around Israel. Israel had gone into exile. All these other nations had flourished around them. Israel comes back and the other nations are going, we don't like these people. We don't like what they're doing. And when they rebuild that temple, that's a sign of rebellion against the king. And they wrote a letter, and you can read about it in Ezra 4, stop this building, and building is stopped by the pagan king. Yet the temple is the identity for God's people. It's the place of worship, sacrifice, and glory. And yet God's people have decided to keep their heads down. It's not like a splash. And they justified this decision. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Oh, the time will come. It'll arrive. But not yet. It's not the Kairos time yet. <laughs> We've got to rethink our tactics. It's not a good time to identify that we live under the lordship of another king. It's a keep your head down world. And that becomes the consensus in Israel as everyone meets around dinner tables, harumphing, harumphing. Well, it's not possibly the time to rebuild the house of the Lord. Blah, blah, blah. You know? Yeah. This is what the Lord Almighty says pointedly. Actually, this is what the true king says. This is the big reveal. This is God calling them out. And when God calls us out, you can be sure that he's going to nail the real issue, isn't he? These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. What does God say? Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Haggai 1 verse 4. You see, God's people were actually interested in houses, just not God's. Just not God's. It wasn't the time to rebuild the Lord's house and find their identity with him, but that didn't mean to say that they weren't doing a lot of trips to Bunnings. That didn't mean the noise of hammer and saw were absent. Now, it simply meant that God's people were occupying themselves with other projects. 
self-identity projects, safer projects that aligned them more with the nations surround them, them that kept the peace, keeping their heads down kind of projects. And note the word, and it's pointed, panelled houses. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses, not your, you know, dodgy houses that you've just thrown together with on the cheap? No, this is, you know, I'm a fan of mid-century modernism. I love panelled houses, okay? It looks like their houses are all a scene from Mad Men. It's not just that their time has been directed somewhere else, it's that their loves have been directed somewhere else. Our practices, what we do, the things we do, enforce, then reinforce what we love. We love what we do, and we do it enough to love it. And God is not fooled by their faux wisdom. Not the right time, time will come, the will say, rah, rah, rah. He sees past the earthly wisdom and says, while my house remains a ruin, which means your relationship with me remains a ruin. If the temple is the place where God is glorified, where sacrifice for sin is made, and when the presence of God is found on the earth, as it was in Israel, then God is not being honoured. God's relationship with his people is in danger of being ruined. The temple, as it stands there in Israel at the time, is a sign for the spiritual state of God's people who are busy making their own houses, busy forging an identity that allows them to keep their heads down and still justify it. How can God get past this? How does God get past this with us? I'm hoping these slides are the order they are because I can't see them. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You can go to a Christian bookshop and buy a book called Your Best Life Now with a man on the front cover almost as handsome as Mark, right? Who was in the Australian last weekend. <laughs> God's only plan for you is to make your life amazing, isn't it? In every way. Your way. But that doesn't seem to be what the text says, does it? See, the God of Haggai is very different to the small g gods of our own creation. And God watches this situation and then he says, give careful thought to your ways. And if you read through Haggai 1, it says that several times. Give a careful thought to your ways. And the really direct translation of that is give careful thought to your ways, if it's said that often. Right? I didn't need my Greek for that, or my Hebrew. Give careful thought to your ways. This is what God says. You've so much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins. There it is again. While each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain and the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labours. Life is hard, and God says, you know what? I'm going to make it harder. This is not your best life now. You think it's hard having Persia ruling over you, and you think, I'm going to eke out an existence, and I'm going to try and flourish a little bit in my career, and I'm stripping it away. I'm the one doing that. You put your money in a bag with holes in it, and I cut the hole in the bag. First sight, it looks like God is being capricious and mean. But you need to pull the camera back and look at the big picture of Scripture. Because God is saying here, everything may have changed in this world. It may feel like a keep your head down world. But I haven't changed. 
How so? Go back to Israel in the desert. Go back to the blessings and curses of God's covenant. Or he says, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. Lots of kids, lots of crops, lots of this, lots of that. If you disobey me, I'll cut a corner off that bag and all the money will come out. And I haven't changed. Ironically, this is a comfort to the people of God that everything else on the landscape has changed, but God himself is faithful. God himself is faithful to his people. God himself is faithful to his people in order, order that his people would live in order to bring glory to him. And God's big deal in the world is that God will get glory. God thinks that God is the best thing in the universe. <laughs> arrogant of him? <laughs> well, of course he is. <laughs> it's a comfort. God says, it looks tough, but it's me keeping faith with covenant. I'm calling you back to covenant. I'm calling you back to the love that you should have. The Perth people, let's give careful thought to our ways. Now, we live this side of the cross. The covenant curses have been drained by the cross of Jesus. Yet how much more, says Hebrews? How much more should we live as faithful covenant people of God, given that Jesus has taken the curse for us? God has not changed. And our place in society may have, and may do, and may continue to do so. We have no direct control over all of that. Things come out of the blue that we have no idea about. But can the covenant-keeping God keep his promises? And can the covenant-keeping God keep his people? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to think. See, folks, there's no good time to be faithful to God. There's no perfect time. All the planets align. Now's the time. You read through the Bible. It's the times of pressure that we read the stories of faithfulness. And we go, yes, that's what it looks like. There's no good time because everyone who wants to live a godly life will suffer for the sake of the king. Genesis through to Revelation. Righteous Abel through to the martyrs under the altar, saying, How long, O Lord, in the book of Revelation? There's no good time. But there's a good God in the midst of every time. And that should be our encouragement. By the end of chapter 1, work begins again in the temple. Astonishing. They've been going, oh, no, no good time. It's not the right time. And suddenly it is the right time. <laughs> How did that happen? It says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts their God. Some 20 years of nothing, suddenly, action. Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Interest in their own panelled houses suddenly wanes. Thomas Chalmers, in a great sermon, talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. The panelled houses suddenly looked cheap and gaudy when their God confronted them again and showed them his grace, and they got back to the task. The question is, what changed? Did the Persian king suddenly become much more amenable? Did they win a battle in the high court? Did they set, set up the Benedict option? No, oh, I love the book. <laughs> Here's the right answer. God is with them. God is with them. And what does he do? It says he stirs up their spirit. You see, that's the gospel in the Old Testament. Because God enables them to do by spirit what they cannot do in the flesh. No one can say that Jesus is Lord 
unless the Spirit of God enables them. No one can identify with the persecuted king of Israel, the crucified one, unless God enables them. No one can kill the sin in their life unless God enables them. Because the Lord's Spirit does that work. God gives them a desire they did not have and changes their lives. And in the big picture, why was it so important in the book of Haggai that the temple should be rebuilt, given it's not there anymore? Well, it's so that Jesus, the true place of sacrifice for sin, the true location of God's glory on the earth, can stand before that temple and say, it's about me. It's about me. My spirit will inhabit my temple, the people of God, fully and finally. Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected. No good time to honour God. Becomes the chief cornerstone. Jesus is our focus. He's our goal. He's our God. And you read it in 1 Peter. You don't be ashamed to come to him. Not ashamed. Plenty of earthly reasons to say, oh, the time has not yet come to live for Jesus, but I'll build my paneled life. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by humans, chosen and precious in the sight of God. And let yourselves be built up into that holy temple, which we are in Christ. Where does it all leave us? I think it leaves us there. <laughs> Let me explain. Every action embeds a hypothesis about the future. We just don't know the small F future, even though we know the capital F future. And it makes all the difference for this young lad if he thought he was getting onto a cable car or a roller coaster. Doesn't it? <coughs> you get in a cable car and you think the future looks like that. But if you get onto a cable car, it turns out to be a roller coaster. It looks a little different, doesn't it? We live in an era of rapid, discontinuous change. It's more roller coaster than cable car, and there are many things we can't predict, not the least of all. An election a few months ago. Expect the unexpected. Yet, I am with you, says the Lord. I am with you. So our task is to bring glory to him in whatever we do and keep our heads up in a keep our heads down world. Yeah? Why? Not because we know the future in the immediate, but because we have a brave leader who went to the cross, despised for us, to create a future for us that is hope-filled and allows us to be those with hope in a despairing world. We can't predict the future in the immediate, but we do know that God is in control of it. Come to him. Come to him. Take pleasure in who he is, because he takes pleasure in his people. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for the Lord Jesus. He faced the time that he did, the great struggle of the cross, the great opposition from sinful men. And may we think on him, lest we grow weary in our hearts. May we do good. May our lives not be drawn away to things that identify us elsewhere, but let our identity be found in you. May we bring glory to you. We thank you for taking the covenant curses on the cross through Jesus. May we therefore much more be ready to live a life of godliness and purity and holiness and joy for the sake of our great King, the one and only King, King Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.